welcome back. Today our video lecture is coming from a new location from the second floor of Old Main where graduate employees who are rallying to form a union are here doing our work of all sorts, preparing for class, doing research and other things uh, to show exactly how much work goes in and how valuable we are to the university. So welcome to Old Main. Today we'll cover one of the most counterintuitive but also the most important elements of statistics, the central limit theory. In a nutshell, CLT allows us to use the sample we do have to infer about other samples we could have drawn from the same population without any additional information. Where we're headed with this is to extend the logic we use to interpret means and variances to more complex equations, both to estimate single statistics and multivariate models, and importantly, to help us make empirical estimates of how likely properties of the sample are to also be true of the population it's drawn from. But to do so, we first need to understand two other important concepts, the sampling distribution and the standard error. As you'll see, it's important not to confuse these with the similar sounding sample distribution and standard deviation. You already know that different samples from the same population will have different means and other different parameters. Usually, real life uses a single sample for each population, but assuming you sample the data somewhat randomly, there are always a variety of samples of a given size you could have drawn. Now, if we imagine repeatedly drawing samples from the same pool of possible respondents, each one would have a different mean. But the mean is our best guess as to the mean of a population from one sample. So should we just throw out the mean because it's likely not completely accurate? Well, if you said no, you're correct. We can only use what we know about probability distribution. We can use what we know about probability distributions together with some neat characteristics of sampling distributions, even the imaginary kind, to estimate a range of likely population means that could have produced a distribution like the observed sample. The key to all of it is what we, what's called the central limit theorem. It states this. If each sample is large enough, the mean or any other statistic of the sampling distribution is normally distributed and centered on the population mean regardless of the shape of the original distribution. That's a mouthful. Let's take a step back to really understand each part because it's one of the most important theorems that allows us to do statistics at all, even though we don't actually know the sampling distribution empirically. The mean of the sampling distribution we noticed before that different samples from the same population are likely to have different means. Even though we acted then like it was a problem, those differences are actually valuable and important because they're not random. We take a sample mean by adding all the raw scores in a sample and dividing by the number of cases. A sampling distribution is just another kind of sample, specifically a sample of samples. We know that even if we can't observe it, a mean exists because there are a range of possible values that can be added and divided by the number of samples. Next, centered on the population mean. The sample mean of a variable will always be the value that minimizes the sum of squared errors or the variance. Your textbook shows up with a graphical example, but it's always true. The mean of the sampling distribution is still a mean, so it follows the same rules. The more times we observe something, the better we can understand it, and the more accurately we can estimate the mean and other statistics. Next normally distributed regardless of the shape of the original distribution. Now the genius of the central limit theorem is here. Mathematicians have proved that not only is the sampling mean an unbiased estimate of the population mean, the sampling mean, remember, the sample mean, the distribution of possible sample means is always normally distributed. In other words, if we ask a small number of different people their income, we could randomly get a sample that's particularly poor or particularly wealthy, but if we kept asking different samples of people from the same population over time, we would have samples that balanced out that initially biased sample. In the most common case, we'll naturally be having some kind of a mix, in which case the sample mean will be closer to the true mean. Finally, if each sample is large enough, I saved this for last because in practice, social scientists often don't need to worry about this. There are various rules of thumb in most situations, 30 to 40 cases and up. But when it comes down to it, more or less you have to know your data well enough to know if there should be a concern. The reason it's often less important for social scientists and sociologists in particular is that a representative sample with 500 to 1,000 or more cases 
to the typical size of a political pulse poll, and much smaller than a major national survey like the General Social Survey. That size of sample is large enough to invoke the central limit theorem regardless of whether the distribution is normal, skewed, binaural, or any other odd shape. It even holds true for yes-no questions. We only have two possible answers. We don't actually estimate these sample means, but we can estimate the ranges likely to lie based on the shape of the observed distribution, which leads us to one last trick we have up our sleeve. Just like there's a sampling mean, there's also a sam sampling standard deviation called the standard error of the statistic, like the standard error of the mean. For the mean, the standard error is simply the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So again, the standard error is the standard deviation of the sample sampling statistic. When you're calculating it for the mean, it's the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Put differently, the precision of our estimates increases according to the square root of the sample size. So at a few cases, when you only have a small number, it can produce a major reduction in the standard error. Well, it takes many more cases when you already have thousands in the data set. And because it's actually a type of standard deviation, the standard error, which we can calculate from our sample thanks to the central limit theorem, can be interpreted in the same way which means we can also draw on the probability distributions using our z-tables that we used before for a normal distribution and estimate, for example, a range which in there's a 95% probability that the true population mean, the original variable, falls. But we'll save more talk about those called confidence intervals for the next lecture. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Say thank you to your local graduate employee.